All right, it's good to see everybody again tonight. Thank you for being here. We are, um, I'm excited to start a new study tonight. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who have been here, you know that we have studied uh, for several months, we'd studied the book of Revelation and um, finished that up a couple of weeks ago. And uh, really a, a great study. I, I felt like it was a good study and enjoyed it very much. But I'm one of those people that always likes something new as well. And so here we are, something new. And um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm excited about that. We're going to study and go through the book of Daniel in uh, probably eight or nine weeks or so to get us through. If you look in the materials, you kind of get a, an idea of how it's laid out. But um, really, really a great character of Scripture and, and one who um, really has a couple of different purposes a couple of different ways in which we can look at him, and um, and we're going to do that tonight. We're going to just kind of look at look at that breakdown of how Daniel is um, is is portrayed and looked at, and uh, then we will we will get into the subsequent weeks, the stories that are associated with him and. Really, the the reason why he ends up being a character that we that we look to. But I want us to um, to go tonight, if in your Bible, to Daniel chapter one, and we're just really going to focus in on chapter one tonight and some of the historical background of of um, of Daniel. And we'll uh, we'll do our best. I'll do my best to keep these things. Um, in front of you, in the notes part at least, in front of you, in in uh, in, in order, and in a way that makes makes sense. But I want us to begin um, just by looking at the name Daniel, and we'll do that we'll do that with some other names here in just a little bit as well. But uh, Daniel, the name, the Hebrew name means God is my judge. That's really the premise. We have to understand about Daniel, and it's important that we look at that from the very beginning, that his name means God is my judge, because everything that we'll see in Daniel's life, the stories that we're going to look at, the way that he conducts himself, the way that he carries himself, the way that he uh, speaks, the actions that he takes, the decisions that he makes, all of those things point to Daniel having a clear understanding of who he is. And he understands who he is in relationship to God. He understands that he is God's person and that God is the one who will look at his life and be the authority and the judge of what his life is like. So God is my judge. Now, names in the, in the Old Testament, you know, they mean things. They have a meaning behind them. And, uh, you know, when, when, when you're selecting names for, for children in this modern world, a lot of people go, you know, what name is cute? And, you know, how, how can we take that and how can we, um, how can we shorten it to a, a nice nickname or something like that? Or maybe uh, people, when they're choosing names, they want, they, they want to go to, to names that seem to be sort of, um, um, now the trend is, is names that are a little bit older, maybe that are kind of making a comeback, and so everybody's naming their kids, you know, after after uh, flowers and things like that, and so, you know, people having babies now name them Daisy and think, well, that's so unique and so different, and what's going to happen is, and I know this is going to happen because when they get to kindergarten, uh, Daisy's going to come home from kindergarten and say, guess what, Mom, there's four other Daisies in my class, <laughs> and parents are going to be like, well, that's not what we had in mind. Um, so that's the trend in, in, in our modern world is to name, name children something that we like, something that we think is, is going to be a, a cute name. Uh, but that wasn't how it necessarily In the Old Testament, Many times a person would receive their name from some type of an experience with God. The parents would have an experience with God, and so therefore they would name their kid 
something that would help them remember back to that experience. They would help them to remember back to what, what it was that, that God had done and what they were, what they were experiencing. Maybe they had uh, a name that, that God revealed to them at times, and God would reveal names and say, this is, this is what the name should be. Some places, even in the Old Testament, we see that God himself ascribed the name and said, this is the name that you're going to be. He would change, even in adulthood, he would change names, or he would say, this is the name you're to give to your child. And so Daniel, we don't really know how he got this name, God is my judge, but we know that that is his name, and he understands, uh, as we look through his life, he understands the importance of the significance of the, that word and what it means, that God is my judge. So Daniel is the author of this. Obviously, it's a, it's a book of, of, of his writing and his recollections and his understanding of what God was doing. And um, in, in some places, he refers to himself in the first person, and we'll see that. So there are some, some people who get confused and say, well, you know, Daniel didn't really write that. But Daniel, he did. He wrote it. He just wrote it in the first person. He referred to himself as his own name. And so let me just give you a little bit of a historical background on, on the writing here. Daniel was written in the late 6th century B.C. The late 6th century so 600 or 600 or so years <clears throat> prior to the birth of Jesus Daniel was living and Daniel was 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 hearing from God and Daniel was writing what the Lord was giving to him and speaking and prophesying even what the Lord was giving to him because Daniel has multiple different uh roles as we'll come to see within within the kingdom and, and what what those do but he lands among the prophets in scripture if you look at the books around daniel you'll see that there are books of prophecy there are books that we consider uh, prophetic books in the old testament so he his writing lands among the prophets but yet he's unique because he has these incredible stories that we that we learn in daniel Stories that, that I call Sunday school stories. You know what a Sunday school story is. It's one of those that you hear many times as a child. You know, it just comes up over and over again. And it teaches you great principles about God and about what, what God does and how the, the power of God and, and the person of God. And he, he has these great stories that are, that are packaged into the rest of his writing, which is which is largely prophetic and, and historical. He's got a lot of historical writing. It was prophetic at the time. It's historical now. And then there is prophetic in, in terms of it's not yet happened. So he's, he's got so many different layers to who he is. He's this incredible character who possesses a, a knowledge of, of right and wrong that is, is really sort of remarkable when you look at him in Scripture, this is just how in tune to who he to who he is and who who God is in him, and how he how that how he lives that out. He's also a historical writer. He talks about history. He can he can he can see historical events and his visions and his dreams and and process those out and speak those out. He is a a uh, an advisor to the kingdom and and one who becomes trusted in in some pretty difficult circumstances as we'll. See, see tonight, and then he's also, he lands among the prophets. He is a prophetic writer and a prophetic speaker. So he writes uh, in the late 6th century B.C., and he writes at a time, uh, at the time, in the time of Babylonian captivity. Babylonian captivity is taking place and has taken place at the time in which he writes. So Daniel is, is born, really, during the middle of the reign of King Josiah, the, the king of Judah. And we, we read about the reign of Josiah in 2 Kings chapter, uh, chapters 22 and 23. And, and Josiah was a king who brought about a lot of reform in Israel, brought about a lot of change, bringing people back to God, bringing God back to the forefront of the national conversation. 
And so Daniel grew up in that environment. That's how he knew who God was. That's how he learned who God was. He, he was born and he was, he was growing up in a time when changes were being made in Israel that were designed to bring people back to God. And so Daniel was affected by that. He was influenced by that. He saw that happening. Daniel would have been, would have been alive and hearing the messages of, of other people, other prophets like uh, Jeremiah. And he quotes Jeremiah in, in chapter 9. He, he remembers the words of Jeremiah. And so Josiah is the king of Israel. Daniel is growing up in his, his young, formative years in, in really a time of national revival where the nation of Israel is coming back to God. And Josiah is, King Josiah is killed in battle around uh, somewhere around 609, 608 BC, something like that. He's killed in a battle against Egypt. And within a matter of just a few years after Josiah dies, after he's killed in battle, the southern kingdom of Judah, where Daniel lived, falls back away from God, falls back into its evil ways, becomes, becomes evil again, becomes distanced from God again, becomes, uh, becomes a kingdom that is not, not the same kingdom that Daniel grew up in as a young boy. By now he's in his, his teenage years, and uh, he's, he has seen, he has come up in a, in a time of national revival. He's seen what it's like for people to have a fervor for God. And now he sees this, this change, this shift. And the nation begins to fade away and fall out of favor with God. At the same time, in another, another part of the world not too far away, Nebuchadnezzar, who we're going to read about tonight, becomes the, the king of a, of a place called Babylon. And he becomes king of Babylon at about 605 B.C. And as the, as the new king, he wanted, to, he wanted to make a statement. He wanted to show his dominance to the world. And so um, shortly after he became king, he began to invade neighboring countries. Babylon really was uh, what we would call today modern, modern Iraq and the northern parts of modern Saudi Arabia. So if you look at a map of the Middle East today and you look at the northern the northern swath of Saudi Arabia and then kind of make a make a little turn up into Iraq, you'll see that that would be the area that would was approximate locations of the Babylonian kingdom. And so Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make a statement. He wanted to grab some land. He wanted to um, he wanted to to show that Babylon was strong and that Babylon was a force to be reckoned with because there were other empires in that part of the world as well that were threatening to do, to do the same. And so he goes, to, he goes to Judah, the southernmost part of Israel, the southern kingdom, the southern part of, of Israel, and surrounds it. He, he goes to Jerusalem and, and, and besieges it, surrounds the city, cuts off supplies, cuts off movement in and out of the city, basically starving the city to death until finally they surrender. And he is, is, once the surrender is complete, he begins to take back to Babylon people that he saw as being desirable to help Babylon grow, to help Babylon sustain itself. He was looking for the young. He was looking for those who had a sharp mind. He was looking for those who had a, a certain physical quality and attractiveness to them, both men and women. And so we read about that in this opening couple of, of verses. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse 1, of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2 says, The Lord, the Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah. And permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylon and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other 
noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So we get a little, a little slice, a little sliver into Daniel's life. He was, he was of some type of noble descent. There was something in his family line that mattered, something that was important. He wasn't just a kid who was kind of off out on his own and wouldn't have been noticed. There was a reason why he captured the attention of the Babylonian officials because he was either in a noble family or he was, he was affiliated with a noble family in some ways or royal, royalty in some form or fashion. And so he, is, he, he catches the attention enough so that he is carried away as one of the captives into Babylon. But I want to go back to verse 2 because I think this is important. Daniel says, and he writes this, that the Lord gave him, gave King Nebuchadnezzar, Victory. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. The Lord did that. Now Daniel's grown up in the ways of God. He's heard what it means to live for God. He knows who God is. And he knows enough to know that God has a plan, has a covenant with the nation of Israel. He lives under that covenant. He understands that covenant that has been taught to him and rehearsed to him, and he has heard it. But yet he gets to verse 2, and he says that it's the Lord who gave victory to the pagan kingdom of Babylon over the king of Judah. Now, why would, why would God allow that? Why would God do that? Why would that happen? Sometimes, sometimes, and we know this to be true, God permits things to happen that on the surface look like they don't make any sense. God permits things to happen in our lives. He permits things to happen sometimes in our world. He permits things to happen in our country. He permits things to happen in our culture that we all just want to stand up and say, no, God, that's not right. Don't do that. Don't let this happen. Or we question, you know, why are you letting this happen? Why did this happen? Why why is it the way that it is in our world sometimes? And they're, they're, they're rational questions. They're reasonable questions. But sometimes the Lord allows this to happen that we if we had our choice, would say, no, let's not let that happen. What was God doing? What was, what was the purpose of this? What was the reason for this? Well, if we go back into, into 2 Kings, you kind of get a glimpse into it. You know, the, the people of Israel, the, the leadership especially, had fallen away from God again. They had, they had stopped following God's ways. And and it's as if the Lord is saying, okay, well, if you don't want to follow me, then you can have it your way, but there's consequences to having it your way. There's consequences to when you, you kind of branch off on your own and let things happen your own way. There, there may be some things that you have to face, things to go through. And so in, in Daniel chapter two or chapter one and verse two, I think we see that, that the Lord, the Lord didn't remove did not remove Israel from his, his eye, but he did allow Israel to walk out from under his hand. And it's very possible for us to do that. We can, we can allow ourselves, if, if, we, if, we, if we play around and sin long enough, we can allow ourselves to, to walk far enough away that we're out of the protective hand of God, out of the preventive hand of God, where God says, you've, you've come to a place now where you're kind of calling the shots and I'm not. And that's really what's happening with Israel. They were at a place where, where things had, had progressed to that point where they had fallen away from, from God. And so Daniel is taken into captivity in verse 3. In verse 4, it says, select only the strong healthy, good-looking young men. 
I guess I would have gone to Babylon. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning. Make sure that they're gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. There was a, there was a pedigree they were looking for. Train these young men, and there were young women taken as well, but the focus here is on the young men. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Train them, bring them into our culture, infuse in them an understanding of who we are and what, what, this, what this empire is all about, and, and make sure they know our language do everything you can to erase all that stuff that they came from, and let's make them like us. Let's bring them into our captivity so that they can become like us. The king assigned them, in verse 5, a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. It was good stuff, good food. And they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Now, I just want to stop there for a minute and just make sure that we've covered the historical parts here. It's, it's, a, it's a period of Babylonian captivity, and Daniel, when it's all said and done, covers a time period of about 60 years. The majority of Daniel's life is covered in, in the book of Daniel, about 60 years. But when we... <clears throat> We will look at um, at this book of Daniel, this this writing. We're going to find that there's there's three key parts, three key divisions of the book of Daniel. We're going to learn about his life. It says introduction to who he is as a person. That's what we're doing tonight in, in chapter one. Chapters two through seven really cover his character development. We we trace him and his friends, and we'll be introduced to them in just a moment, his friends in the development of their character and who they are and, and who they become. And then the last part, the, the third division of Daniel in chapters 8 through 12 is really his visions about future events. So it's more the prophetic part that happens at the last uh, little less than half of the book. But we find in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 6 that there are four young men, Daniel being one of them, who are mentioned as, as specifically in, in, uh, in, in Daniel. So verse 6 says that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all of them from the tribe of Judah. Now, why does Daniel pick out these other three besides himself? Probably because they, were, they, they may have been friends before they were ever taken. They may have known each other uh, back in Judah. Judah. They may also have been placed together when they got to Babylon, sort of maybe, maybe uh, roommates or something, something like it. But for whatever reason, Daniel knows about these other three. And there's probably more that he knew, but he, he singles out these other three. And their names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah, they're all changed. Everyone gets a change of name when they get into Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar changes the names of all the captives because he wants to make them Babylonian. And those names that, that we read here in verse 6, those are Hebrew names. They're not, they're not, ba not Babylonian. So in an attempt to try to bring them into the culture, in an attempt to try to make them Babylonian, their names are changed. And so Daniel, as we already said, his name means God is my judge. His new name given to him was Belshazzar. And that name means Bel, B-E-L, protect his life. Bel was the chief Babylonian god. So Daniel is changed from the name in Hebrew that means God is my judge, Jehovah God is my judge, changed to a name in Babylonian that beckons and calls upon the chief Babylonian god, Bel, also called Murdoch, or Murdoch, 
to protect his life. He's given that, that radical change of name. Hananiah in Hebrew means the Lord shows grace. Hananiah, the first friend that he mentions other than himself, means the Lord shows grace. His Hebrew upbringing, all of his life, he had learned and heard his name. And every time he heard his name, he was reminded that the Lord shows grace, that the Lord is good, that the Lord is with me, and that he's gracious to me. And he's given a new name in Babylon, and his new name is Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, A-K-U, under the command of Aku, who was the moon god in Babylon. So he's given a name in Hebrew by his mom and dad that means the Lord shows grace. He gets to Babylon, and that name is replaced now by a name that means that you're under the command of the moon god. This is, this is beyond just trying to indoctrinate young people. This is, this is mental manipulation and mental warfare, if you will, against these young people who are taken captive. Mishael means who is like God. Every time he hears his name, remembering that there is no one like God, that God is, is supreme and that God... God is, is God alone. And his new name given to him is Meshach, which means who is like Aku, who is like the moon god. Is there any like the moon god? The third one, or the fourth one rather, Azariah, is given the Hebrew name at birth, and his name Azariah means the Lord helps. The Lord helps. The Lord helps me. The Lord is with me. He helps me when I need help. And his new name is given to him in Babylon. That name is Abednego, which means that he is the servant of Nebo or Nebu, which was the God of learning and writing. So every one of these names now call upon false gods, false deities, pagan gods, and that's what Babylon was known for. It was known as a place that was, that was totally sold out to paganism and sold out to a, a variety of gods and searching out and everything they could through nature and through writing and through, through different forms of expression and art and things like that. They would, they would make images and call it a god and they would ask that image to do something that, that statue or that image to do something for them they were doing everything they could to have a life that was good by calling out to false gods and so these young men and women too they get to Babylon and so now they say well you can't have the Hebrew names any longer you can't you can't uh, you can't have that understanding anymore we're going to change your name and when we change your name the thought was it's going to change your character it's going to change what you believe. It's going to change who you are. And so verse 7 says that uh, the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. And we see there Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're told, you've got to eat this new food now. You've got to eat this new diet. And this new diet is going to help you get, get healthy. And, and it's going to... It's going to help you gain favor and an advantage and you're going to learn and we're going to teach you literature and we're going to teach you all, all kinds of things and we're going to train you and you're going to learn our language and everything about your life is going to become Babylonian. Everything about your life is going to become different. And for many of the captives who were brought into Babylon, the answer was, okay, okay. I'll do it. I don't really have a choice. I'll do it. I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to do because they were afraid of the consequence. They were afraid of what might happen if they didn't do it. But Daniel and his friends were different. Verse 8 says, but Daniel was determined. 
not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He was determined not to defile himself. He was in a place where nobody was watching. Nobody was looking over his shoulder. Nobody, nobody was, was saying, Daniel, don't do this. Don't do that. He was at a place where he could have chosen to take the food and to take the wine and to, and to, to eat and live and breathe Babylonian culture until he became that on the inside. But there was something about him and about his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that said, don't do that. You can't do that. That's not right. You see, they could change their names, but they couldn't change what was already in their hearts. They couldn't change what God had already done within them. There were some who no doubt fell to the, to the, to the plans of the Babylonians and, and became Babylonian in every sense, except maybe their blood. But Daniel says, I'm not going to do it. I determined that I'm not going to defile myself by eating this food and by indulging in this culture to the point that I become completely not who God intended for me to be. I know God is my judge, and as long as God is my judge, I've got to do what God says to do. It's a good lesson for all of us. It's really the first character lesson that we learned from Daniel is that sometimes we find ourselves in places where maybe nobody would know if we crossed the line. Nobody would know if we said that thing that we shouldn't say or if we did that thing that we shouldn't. Nobody would know. But Daniel had a keen understanding that even though no one would know and it wouldn't get back to Judah and and, and even if it did, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. He had that keen understanding that God would know and that I'm, I'm, I'm made for God's purpose and I'm made for God's plan and I might be a captive in a place where I, I would choose not to be if I could help it, but I still have a purpose that is assigned to me by God himself. And so Daniel chooses not to defile himself by eating the food or the wine that's given to them by the king. Instead, he asked for the chief of staff to get permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, what was in this food that was acceptable? Well, probably, probably nothing. It was probably really fine, good food. But it wasn't the diet that Daniel was accustomed to. It wasn't, it wasn't the food that had sustained him in a land of God's promise and God's blessing. And it wasn't so much the food that he was rejecting. It was the idea of, if I do this, I'm going to tether myself to this culture and to this lifestyle, and I'm not going to do it. Verse 9 says, Now God had given the chief of staff both, both respect and affection for Daniel. There was something about Daniel that just caused people to like him. But he responded in verse 10, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid that the king will have me beheaded. So the servant now is saying, I don't want to do this because... This, this affects me. If I let you go through with this and you don't, you don't eat this food and you get all, you get all pale and, and thin and, and, and you get weak in your body, then they're going to blame that on me. And, and that's not good for me. So Daniel, verse 11, spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishaiah, and Azariah. He says in verse 12, please test us for 10 days. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. And Daniel said at the end of 10 days, see how we look. 
compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. And at the end of, end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. So Daniel and his friends passed the test. It shows the power of God through faith. It shows the power of God through sanctification. I would put those two words together, faith and sanctification. Daniel said, I'm going to set myself apart. I know that I have a purpose from God, and so I'm going to set myself differently from the rest of this culture and from the rest of this world. It shows the power of God through faith and sanctification. And God favored Daniel in his decision to honor the Lord. He favors him. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. Now, I like vegetables. Some of them. A few of them. All right, one or two of them. I like more than that. But if, if that's all I ate couple of things are going to happen. One, I'm, I'm going to get hangry, and that's not going to be good because I like vegetables, but I like steak too. And I like, I like meat, and, and that's just some of you do too. I can, I can tell. So another thing that's going to happen if I eat vegetables is... There's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of layers to all of us. There's a lot of layers that would would go away. And we would we would get thin and and we would see a noticeable difference in our bodies. But God favored these young men. They didn't have to go back and the, the scripture doesn't say well you know to make up for the loss of protein that they had from not eating meat. That they had to go to the they had to go to the fitness center in Babylon and work out five or six hours a day. That's not what it says to make up and to compensate. God favored them. God simply honored their decision that they weren't going to defile themselves with the king's food, and God supernaturally sustained them and gave to them a level of health and vigor and vitality in their bodies that wasn't seen in the other the other young men. So God God favored Daniel in in his decision to honor the Lord. And and Daniel says that at the end, when it was all said and done, that not only were we healthier physically, but we we were fit in our minds. We could understand things. We picked up things quickly. We could could understand the, the writings and the teachings, and we learned the language. And God favored us in that way. And and again, it wasn't about God saying, well, you're going to become Babylonian. It was about God saying, you need to learn this, and you're going to learn this so I can use you in Babylon. If you understand the language and you understand the culture, that gives you an ability to be used in this culture. And it says that God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. That's verse 17. God gives him this ability. Now, dreams are going to become very important as we look at this study because it's one of the ways in which God speaks and Daniel then interprets these, these dreams. So, in Babylon, and, and really in this Mesopotamia, the idea of, of dreams and divination was, was really important. Um, to them, and it was really an important part of their culture and who they were. And so 
God gives Daniel this ability to understand this. He doesn't make Daniel into a person who himself, himself delves into divination, but he does give him the ability to lift the veil from it and understand it. And so this divination in, involved, first of all, a, a dream. It involved dreams. It would come through dreams. And a dream was believed to be a communication from the gods, that you would dream something as you slept, and that was the god's way of speaking to you. So whether it was the god of the moon or the god of the sun or the god of whatever, that god was speaking to you through a dream. And so this was one, one aspect of Mesopotamian divination. They would, they would put a lot of stock into dreams and what God was trying to say through a dream. Now, you know, thank goodness we don't put a whole lot of, a whole lot of stock into some of our dreams today because if, if that was the way that God spoke to us, God's doing some weird things. Now, so I believe God can use a dream but these people took it to a level to where every dream meant something. Every dream had a, a message from the gods, and you, your life was about trying to figure out what the dream was. And you know how it is when you wake up in the morning, you think, oh, I know I dreamt something, but I can't remember it. Can you imagine the level of fear and anxiety if that was your life? To say, I know, that, I know that the gods are trying to tell me something, but I can't remember what it was. it was. It was the dream that they believed was a communication from the gods. The other part of, of divination involved, involved a, a person that we call a diviner. And that's spelled D-I-V-I-N-E-R. It's a person who would interpret the dreams. You would have to get up, remember the dream. That's the first part of the challenge. And now you can go to somebody and say, I, I don't know what this means. Help me. And the diviner, their job was to interpret the communication and tell you what it means. And you better hope that they, that they know what they're talking about and that they've got it right because your life might depend on it. This was the, this was the type of living that they had in Babylon, this this highly looking at everything as a potential god or god creature, highly superstitious of everything, and this is how they were living. There were three types of, of communications and dreams being one of them. Three types of three ways that this this divination would occur. It was first first of all. An unsolicited omen. <clears throat> Maybe it was an astrological event. This was something that just kind of happens out of the blue. It's a, it's an it's an omen that they would they would look at something in the natural world and say that has to mean something. An astrological event, um, something that maybe happened politically or nationally. Maybe it was the behavior of animals. They would look at it and say God's trying to tell us something because those animals are acting weird. And so that was. The unsolicited omen. Now, now in the case of an astrological event, like, for example, an eclipse, you know, they would they would certainly look at it and say, "Well, God's trying to get our attention." Now, we have to be careful because I don't know how many how many posts I saw on Facebook and Instagram of people saying, "Hmm, an eclipse must mean that Jesus is coming back." Now, here we are, two days later. We got to be careful. When God set the world in motion, and he set the universe in motion, he knew every once in a while that moon's going to go in front of the sun and there's going to be a shadow on the earth and people might see it. Or every once in a while, there's going to be a, a, a shooting star. Every once in a while, there's going to be a, a meteor storm that happens. God set all that in motion. He said, he said, just let it be, and he set it all in motion, so it's going to happen. And we've got to be careful that we don't look at it and say, well, it must mean that God is doing something different. No, he's not. He set his creation to do what it's going to do, and it's doing what he wants it to do. 
He made it for His pleasure. Not for us to look at and say, well, God's, God's doing something new here. There's an eclipse, and there was just an eclipse a few years ago. That's not what, that's not, that's into this type of divination. And that was one way that they, they thought that the, the gods of their culture was trying, were trying to speak to them. The second thing that they would do is they would ask God a question. They would burn incense or they would offer up sacrifices, human sacrifices even, as a way of asking God questions. You know, God, if, if, you're, if you're this or that, then, then, then you know, do whatever you're going to do with this sacrifice. And it was, it was their way of asking a question. And then the third type of communication they believed that they would get from their gods was dreams. So this whole idea of divination becomes important to Daniel and to his life and to his message because it becomes the work that he's trained in. He's trained in it, first of all, in Babylon. But then it says that God gave him the ability to understand the meaning of visions and dreams. They might have trained him. They might have given him maybe some tools that he could, he could use from their level of understanding. But don't make any mistake about it. Verse, verse, uh, verse 17 says that God is the one who gave him the ability. We can get trained in, in whatever we want to get trained in. We can get trained in, in mechanics. You can get trained in the medical field. You can get trained in education. You can get trained in, in, in whatever it is that you want to get trained in. But God is the one who truly gives us the ability to be what he intends for us to be. God is the one who can take what, what might be ordinary training in an ordinary profession, in ordinary work to most people, and God can make it into your life's mission. And that's exactly what he does with Daniel, he's trained by the Babylonians with their version of, of how they want him to interpret dreams. But God says, I'm going to level it up. I'm going to take you to a place where I give you the ability. And when I give you the ability, it's going to take you much further. It's going to do much more for you than any training or any book you could ever find anywhere. And so God gives him this ability. Verse 18, we, we get to a place where we see... A divine miracle. It says, when the training period ordered by the king was completed, remember it was three years, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So at the end of three years, this training period, they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. That's, a, that's how we know it's about 60 years that this time period covers. So this divine miracle in verses 18 through 20. This kingdom that deals with the occult and deals with divination and, and really what we would call magic is no match for the touch of God on the life of these young men. They're found to be ten times better. And what's, what's interesting is that the Babylonians think, boy, we got some really good teachers here. <laughs> we, we really taught these, these boys well because they understand all of this stuff better than anyone else. But what they can't see, what they can't know because they won't recognize it, is that God is working through them, that God is working in their life, that God, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is giving them a a dynamic understanding, a dynamic mind that the powers of darkness can't touch. It can't, it can't even begin to be revealed. And, and for you and me, that means that whatever, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you're, you're dealing with or talking about or your life's work, 
that God can give you an ability to do it in a way that is above and beyond. That God will set you apart if you'll let him. That God will give you ability to, to know things and to do things and to see things that other people can't see if you'll let him. Never given this was dynamic with wisdom and with knowledge and with a level of skill that was unmatched. And so ten times better than any other life. Life was dedicated to that kind of thing. We're going to stop there tonight. We'll pick up chapter two next week. And so I encourage you to bring your, uh, your materials back. We'll talk next week about uh, some of the dreams, the early dreams that Daniel interprets and uh, what those meant and how it impacted his life. Stand with me if you would, please. <clears throat> Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for tolerating this um, crackly thing that I've got in my hand here. We'll try to get that corrected before next week. Technology is great until it's not. Sometimes it's just not. Let's pray together before we go. Again, Lord, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this wonderful example of, of a life, four lives really, that were totally sold out to you and devoted to you, that you used in a strange place. God, I pray that from this tonight you would teach us again, remind us again, that even though we live in a culture that seems strange and difficult and at best sometimes uh, godless, help us to remember that you can still use us just like you did him, just like you did his three friends. God, help us to realize that it doesn't matter what's outside of us. It matters what's in us and what you've done through us. And Lord, I pray that we would learn that lesson tonight from Daniel, that we can determine that even though our world around us may turn its back on you, we can determine that we will not defile ourselves, that we will live for you and see your ways through. God, watch over us tonight as we leave. Keep us, protect us in all of our ways, and bring us back here Sunday ready to worship you and give you our very best, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.